we would like to move uh, forward to the NPO and we will switch to the Eastern Asia region. Uh, please allow the Dr. Uh, Mr. Adler to share the Taiwanese uh, perspective for five minutes. Okay, take your time, please. Um, hold on a second. I'm trying yeah. to go back. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. All right. I, for some reason, I can't go back to my first slide, but uh, thanks, Dr. Arthur Poe. Uh, it's really a privilege to be here, given that I might be the youngest and most unconventional speaker in this seminar. Uh, most of my education comes from alternative schools and homeschooling. Despite I teach teachers and principals in Taiwan and Hong Kong, I also work with government often. I also have published peer-reviewed articles. I actually, uh, to be very honest, I do not hold a formal degree. So taking this rare opportunity, I'd like to invite you to think out of the box with me. Uh, people often assume that some people are disadvantaged because they lack resources, but is it possible that disadvantaged are actually the most resource abundant? So in fact, this is not a thought experiment. Taiwan is already a living counterfactual of this popular narrative. According to research, uh, rural schools and students in Taiwan overall, they enjoy more resources compared to their counterparts in other areas. Whether in terms of funding, as you can see here, hardware, technology facilities, and activities provide to each student, rural schools and students are far from being disadvantaged. However, we can still see here, uh, the achievement gap between rural and urban students are still significant. So if, a more equal distribution of educational resources does not improve achievement gap. What can we do? Well, other researchers try to find a real cause of the achievement gap in Taiwan as a lack of resources is basically ruled out. I take a different direction to examine the presumption of academic achievement itself and its consequences. But 12 years ago, when I was 14, I started a longitudinal ethnographic research. I follow my best childhood friend. Um, I think he's a Da Vinci-like boy from elementary school to his 20s. I say he's Da Vinci-like because he self-taught himself many cool things, including robotics, 3D animation, jazz impromptu, or like Unicycle that you can see here, before online resources such as Wikipedia were even popular. But in order to perform well on college admission tests, he sacrificed his time improving his skills on his passions for many years. Instead, he focused on excelling in his academic achievements. However, when he finally entered college and wanted to revive his passions, his family encountered a financial crisis that he didn't have any other choice but to drop out to find a job. So even though he was way ahead of his peers in terms of robotics or either in animation when he was still in elementary school, those skills weren't developed enough for him to find a job that could financially support his family. So he didn't have any other choice but to serve the military until his 30s. So this ethnography eventually led to the production of a documentary film, uh, If There is a Reason to Study, uh, which receives awards internationally and was theoretically released in the greater Chinese region. It also led to a development of a theory that I call uh, allocation dependence which I've been publishing and presenting in recent years. Of course, uh, I can't go into the details of both works, but I'd like to share three key insights I find relevant to today's topic. First, is that when you judge students against specific standards, some are always more advant advantageous than others because human beings are not identical replicas of each other. So as long as we do so, inequality is inev inevitable. The second insight is, Academic achievement doesn't necessarily translate to how well off they will be in life. So my friend in the ethnographic research is a living but heartbreaking snapshot of many students who work hard to fit in the standards at the cost of their real strengths. The third insight is only resource allocation and consumptions are entailed in the design of our education system. People are schooled to not include the resource regeneration in their concerns. So coming from these three insights, uh, I, have, I have three questions and goals. Um, is it possible to support students to unfold their own unique way of living and success with equal dignity instead of judging them against specific standards? Also, 
uh, is it possible to support students' whole development towards adaptability instead of forcing them to fit in certain standards? And third, is it possible to redesign our education system to become more circular and regenerative? So first, uh, I'd like to share one of my main research. Uh, I call it learning by caring. Um, it is compared to the older model of learning by thinking or learning by doing, which regardless of uh, which model you follow, uh, the underlying assumption is that students are molding themselves to become instruments to fit in the social machinery. And the more standardized, the, the, the people who achieve are standardized and those who can't do so, they're eliminated or wasted. Um, and learning caring, on the other hand, is instead of trying to judge them or trying to fit them into specific standards at the cost of their potentials, we try to stand on where they are, embark on their learning journeys by actualizing what they care and develop and de unleash their potentials to the greatest. So it, it might sound a little bit abstract, so I'll give you some examples. So this is a, sing is a girl from a single parent low income family. Uh, she dropped out of high school because she had to become the primary care of her grandma, but eventually he started questioning what's the purpose of going to college. But his fa father, despite his socioeconomic situation, he still wanted her to attend college for obvious reasons. But to her, he was think she was thinking, if I don't know what the what's the point of going to, to college, and that uh, wouldn't that be a waste of money? But if I don't go to college, wouldn't that be an emotional burden to my dad? So he participated in our lab's uh, open journals program, which he, which she joins us to interview uh, industry leaders, um, job hunter uh, platforms, and also successful cases without a college degree, and also did some research on social education, so sociology, and so on. Eventually, he brought back a magazine to his father and say, Dad, I did this research, and I found that I don't really need to go to college, at least immediately. I can start developing my skills that's employable. And when I found that I really need to go to college, I think I can go back. So it alleviated his father's worry and also uh, gained her the permission to autonomy. And then he started to embark her journey and eventually without uh, taking test, very rigorous test prep, she was actually invited to join the top university and also got recognitions of presidential award. Of course, we have other cases, for example, uh, like these are school dropouts. They also uh, receive like international awards. And me, myself, I also follow this path to the, the, the me today, like working with governments and so on. So with, with my results of research, I was invited to Zashir to become their R&D director. And one of the projects I work on is revitalizing the rural with our National Development Council. So uh, through, by working on this project, I'm in charge of doing the research. And I found uh, our rural society has this problem that it's being hollowed through our education design. First, the tracking, um, the students, higher achievers, they go to urban areas because they go to fair schools. And those who perform less, they go to rural areas. It becomes a vicious cycle and people want to escape from the rural. Second, um, because students' studies and their learnings are limit, very limited in their campuses, so they don't really know what's going on in their neighborhood. So when they grow up, they think of their future. What can I do in my neighborhood? Nothing. It's only fields and maybe uh, already uh, non like fish fishery uh, uh, factories that's already pretty not in use and so on. So they, they go to the urban areas. So what we do uh, is a solu the solution we do is playful place based learning. So instead of locking students in campuses, we we partner with these rural industries like local shops and including like you see in this picture, it's the, the rural fishery port, which is in decline. But through these uh, playful play, play, place-based learning, they got to 
do things fun instead of just doing test preparations. And they start to emotionally get attached to their neighborhood. And eventually they found, oh, I can actually do this. History sounds fun. Or maybe like doing these traditional handcrafts looks fun. Why don't I join this? So instead of going to the urban areas to become the new urban poor, they actually rejoin their local communities and revitalize the rural and also bring back uh, the uh, vitality of the community. And uh, students, they might not go to the top universities, but they go to the right universities mm -hmm. uh, with scholarships because they really know what, they're, what they want to pursue. So to conclude my presentation, uh, both research I done, there's a common core, uh, which is by say from forecast-based to agent-based talent incubation. So in a traditional model, a top-down or forecast-based approach is that you base your talent manufacturing on industry forecasts. So you, you have to funnel, you have to funnel the students and in that process, you create alienation, marginalization of many, and in inequality, disparity is inevitably entailed in that. But what we do uh, is a bottom up approach, or what I call agent based approach, uh, taking from complex system uh, insights. So students that explore to discover their roles and values in the communities, to find their roles in the ecosystem, and they, they become adaptive agents capable of responding to the needs of the surroundings. And um, in this way, they can develop, although unique and diverse ways of making, living, or contributing to society, but they are equal in their dignity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Adler, at, at I, I think it's very interesting when you talk about the, the concrete case uh, that uh, need us to rethink about our paradigm in it, in, in it education. Uh, I'm very impressed about your approach on the uh, playful place-based education or something. And many people wondering to know how can you uh, deal with the government section when, when you try to propose uh, the very progressive idea on education. Would you please elaborate more? Sure. 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 Uh, just a hold on a second. Just a hold on a second. Mm. Because we have two two speakers here, so so <laughs> there, there's an issue, echo issue. Okay, it's resolved now. So um, two two um, at least two points. I also responded that to um, Dr. Guevara. Um, mm -hmm. So basically, in terms of learning by caring, it's a uh, theory that I'm developing and also publishing. But it, it a large part of that act, action research is done as a third party, as a nonprofit. So basically, as I mentioned, I was dealing with dropouts. So there there wasn't there wasn't an issue uh, mm -hmm. or there wasn't a need to work with the government at all. Although uh, the results uh, impressed the government and so I was invited to speak at the Ministry of Education and some local education boards invited me to speak and also uh, t t uh, speak and sometimes mentor or provide inspiration to their local teachers and administrators. So that's the case for learning by caring. And mm -hmm. I, I plan to continue to, uh, to develop such, such uh, theory and to publish it internationally. And also in terms of the the, the playful place-based learning, um, it was actually also originally developed uh, as a nonprofit, uh, mm. but, but as rec in recent years, our National Development Council, which is the highest uh, central branch for cross-sector uh, collaboration, um, has this national agenda to address the widening disparity mm. between rural and urban areas. So uh, they attempt this in several, in several approaches, um, including like uh, business and medicine. Education is one part of it. So they commission funds to mm -hmm. a civic, civic or private sector mm -hmm. uh, partners um, to, to use such fund to mm -hmm. do research on device strategies and to actually to to implement the strategies and plans that, that are being R&D. And my role at the time 
was the R and D direct because I'm an R and D director. Mm -hmm. I'm responsible for doing that research. So together, Zasher and uh, we work with a local local partner, uh, which has we, we have a pilot community basically mm -hmm. in in uh, in the fish the uh, fishery village that's mm -hmm. already in decline. So we partner with the local partner, which. Uh, has been working on uh, non-traditional education for many years. So together we we did that research and uh, I was more responsible of doing like literature review, but the local partner uh, has more actual cases that we can do interviews. And together we have uh, both literature and actual cases that make a more rigorous research. And based on that research, we just devised uh, basically uh, the the plan that I just mentioned, and and only within two years, uh, the the results has been pretty, pretty uh, impressive to ourselves as well. So basically, to sum up, it uh, it's quite fortunate for us that the government uh, acknowledges that there this there's this issue need to be addressed, uh, and they pro they commission such funds and invite uh, private or civic partners to mm -hmm. receive to use such fund to 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 do something yeah. i would say and uh and it's our it's our of course there will be comp com uh competitors they also uh, try to bid for the commission of course mm -hmm. and so it, it really depends on how well our mm -hmm. research and strategy is devised so mm -hmm. because i've been in the field of education for more than 10 years um, I understand the current education policies, as I also mentioned in the uh, chat box that, uh, and also Mr. Ding also mentioned in our previous session that our latest national curriculum requires all schools to have 20% uh, of uh, school-based curriculum that has to be devised uh, or designed by the school, which mean, which, which is an attempt to encourage more student and uh, teacher joint participation in designing their own study instead of following suit to a centralized curriculum. So uh, we, that was a that's a that's an example. But but having these background knowledge of what are the needs of mm -hmm. uh, the local schools and mm -hmm. the local parents, given this policy environment, we know mm -hmm. how to address those mm -hmm. gaps that is not being addressed yet because, mm -hmm. uh, because of the new policy change, if that oh. makes sense. Thank you very much. It's very clear that you are, uh, have the good strategy to work with the, the different uh, actors in, in the same area like the uh, government sector.